Hi, everybody. I'm here with Professor Ian Brighthope. Uh, Ian, today uh, you've released a substack. Firstly, and probably the most important, where do people go to find your substacks? Well, um, most importantly, you just type in uh, on your browser substack and then my name in full, just Ian Brighthope. No spaces, no full stops, just I-A-N-B-R-I-G-H-T-H-O-P-E. Right. And they're, right. And they're free. Now, it's today's Substack. What's its title? Uh, it's basically corruption. And um, if we don't stamp out, it's, uh, I've uh, got two actually coming out on corruption. Um, one of them is about corruption in the health industry. The other is corruption generally, global corruption. Uh, in uh, in the establishment uh, and the effects of this corruption that's having on our democracy uh, and the weakening of our democracies, as well as, of course, uh, if it goes too far, the weakening of our complete civilization as we know it uh, and as we appreciate it. <clears throat> so, uh, and I think the uh, ordinary average person in the street, the people in um, so-called middle classes, uh, as well as uh, uh, those who are poorer uh, are suffering as a result of uh, globalization and this uh, corruption. And the, in, uh, in fact, Ian, you hit a point that I make quite often. Many of the laws that we pass, including on the environment and around health and those issues, they hit the, the lower socioeconomic grouping in Australia the hardest of all, especially in yes. I agree, Russell. And uh, I've seen it deteriorate over the years that I've been alive. I mean, my father started the business after the Second World War. He was uh, he uh, came out from uh, Europe after the First World War, set up a, a business after the Second World War. Um, uh, he, he actually uh, worked in the RMIT, or the, at that time it was the Working Men's College or Melbourne Tech, uh, training the, uh, the forces on communications. He set up a commu communications business, uh, making uh, transmitters and so on. Uh, and he said uh, he had 10 good years. Uh, and those 10 good years allowed him to retire. Uh, and when he retired, he went back to work and did uh, a lot of voluntary stuff. And uh, it was just uh, such a better time uh, in Australia. And over the years, I've seen it deteriorate. I've been in practices, I've been in business, I've been uh, witnessing the deterioration of our economy and uh, the loss of uh, a, lot, a lot of our industry and manufacturing. Uh, and a country, as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't manufacture. Uh, and just dig stuff out of the ground and send it overseas uh, is a country in uh, deterioration. We, uh, we've suffered enormously and waste is, is one of the things that I'm uh, really uh, concerned about. And the waste is all a result of uh, conflict of interest and corruption. Yeah, yeah. And governments have played a pretty heavy role in that, haven't they? They have, definitely. Um, uh, I mean, they've made decisions based on uh, external forces to, to, to a large extent, and I think those external forces are the globalists uh, who are basically controlling most of what we do. From my perspective, uh, the globalization of health, uh, so-called health, uh, has been a real downfall for uh, our community, uh, our society in general, because I've seen some massive deterioration in health over the years, and the, there's one uh, biomarker, if you like, of uh, that deterioration, and that is the increased incidence of obesity uh, and diabetes and metabolic syndrome. You don't have to go far to find sick people these days, uh, Russell. Somebody said uh, on one of the shows not so long ago, uh, when uh, you went down the beach at the time of Harold Holt's death, uh, when he drowned, the people uh, on the beach, there was no obesity, they were all skinny. Now. Uh, we've accepted uh, obesity as a norm uh, and uh, to be proud of it. Well, uh, I don't think uh, we should be proud of, uh, of an obese and overweight community because uh, it really is a reflection of sickness and disease and a reflection of our uh, of big food uh, that's uh, creating uh, this disease. Uh, basically, most of our degenerative diseases are, are lifestyle diseases and our lifestyle it's got a lot to do with what we think in our head, what we put into our mouth, and what we do with our legs and arms in terms of the amount of exercise we do. Uh, <clears throat> and um, believe you me, the uh, the junk food, the fast food, the ultra-processed food is basically 
sugar white flour products uh, and some flavoring and colorings and uh, some seed oils that are contributing to um, inflammation uh, in, uh, in those with inflammatory illnesses. And it doesn't take much of these seed oils to actually promote the inflammation and the de degeneration that occurs in our cardiovascular system, in our central nervous system and in, the, in our immune system as well, Russell. Um, you know, some people are starting to wake up to this, but we need the entire community to wake up to it. We need the entire community to be educated and informed. Uh, and I was saying to um, your uh, assistant, your PA, um, your advisor just before that um, as a young woman, if you were told that you're going to have a healthy baby uh, and uh, you're looking forward to having a healthy baby and breastfeeding that baby and bringing it up normally, but the first day of its life, it's going to be injected with some aluminium. How would you feel about it? And that's what happened. They're all injected with aluminium. Uh, and aluminium is a toxin. And so we have to wonder why uh, are we injecting aluminium into, into one year old, sorry, one day old babies uh, to protect them against uh, uh, a virus that they're never going to come across until they're much older, and that is the hepatitis virus. And it's well, just. There always has to be a tipping point or a, or a moment or a, 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 I don't know, I don't know what to call it, but some event that actually changes what's been slowly happening for 50 years. Because I remember the time when you go down to the beach and everybody was thin. And we, in our community, we, we may have had um, one obese person in the community and there might have been a reason for that. I, I don't know. Um, but um, you know, that's out of a town of about oh, 900 people. Um, and, and obesity wasn't the norm, and nor was it the norm across um, much of the other communities that I lived in and around. They were country communities. But so, and, and that's been so gradual that it's been accepted, 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 you know, a bit bigger, a bit bigger, a bit bigger, and then very large, and then obese. Obese is a, a pretty strong word. Professor Brighthope, a very strong word, but I've seen obesity. Well, I've, I've seen, seen obesity. Children, I've yeah. seen it in the children. I see it in the mums. I see it in the dads. I yeah. see it in the families. Yeah. Um, what What's a catalyst that can change that, or do we have to wait for a cataclysmic event? Uh, look, I, I think, Russell, uh, you, you're talking about a, a point in time and an inflection point where people start to wake up to what's going on. Uh, and uh, it, there's an opportunity when we come to elections for people to start thinking again about what's going on. Uh, a lot of us stop thinking uh, and uh, just live our normal daily lives. But I think it's important that our next upcoming election, the big issue should be corruption. And corruption in every system that we've got, including education. And I think we, we do really need to get the message across that we would all be better off. We've got a fantastic country. We've got fantastic people. I love our country. I love our people. And I love what, what we can do and what, what our potential is. But we're destroying it because we're allowing um, bureaucrats and some politicians to get away with murder. Uh, and I'm talking about murdering the economy uh, and murdering our healthcare system uh, and our food chain, food supply. And if, if we can convince everybody, you'll be better off if we stop wasting money on drugs that don't make people well, if we start putting money into, into uh, healthy food rather than the rubbish that's being sold in supermarkets, if we educate them to the point where, okay, you're going to have more money in your pocket if we're not spending money on disease and giving a lot of billions of dollars every year to big pharma and uh, wasteful big food, we can save a lot of money by doing that and saving money uh, so that we can actually re-establish a good primary healthcare system that, that is not overburdened with doctors who know how to make people healthy, not just to treat their disease. And that's what, I'm, as you know, I've been involved in retraining and, and, and upskilling uh, the medical profession in nutritional and environmental medicine to make people healthy for the last 50 years. Uh, and it's, it's been, I've been frustrated for 50 years but that frustration uh, has been a, a driver, I guess, or an incentive for us to keep going uh, to the point where 
during COVID, it was one of the worst times I've had in, in healthcare because I knew and my colleagues knew that if we just tested everybody for vitamin D levels, we got their vitamin D levels up, majority of us would only get a, a mild cold or flu-like illness um, and nobody who was under the age of 80 would have died from it. Mm. And those who are over 80 uh, would have perhaps even survived better than what they did. We because didn't need in, an, in a nursing home, you're not getting a lot of vitamin D, are you, unless it's supplemented? Yeah, that's right, Russell. <laughs> you know, the, in a nursing home, you're inside, like uh, in a cave virtually, uh, and those who live in caves don't get vitamin D, they don't get sunlight. And we like plants, we need the sunlight. It's, it's not only for vitamin D, it actually makes us feel better because it's got other, yeah. other effects, you know. And, and a lot of people are starting to understand this, but every, every epidemic of flu when, uh, during the winter, we would always test for vitamin C, D and zinc, uh, the, 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 the three, three critical nutrients for the immune system to really hammer uh, the viruses and bacteria uh, that, that come along. But unfortunately, my profession are told, oh, you don't need to test for vitamin D. I mean, this is bizarre when over 50% of us have got vitamin D insufficiencies and a large number have got, you know, outright deficiencies. Russell, we, we tried to get into the nursing homes during COVID uh, and, uh, and test the people, in, the elderly people for their vitamin D status so that we could actually correct it. Uh, and some of the managements uh, were okay for that, but they got medical advice uh, not to do it, which uh, it, it's it's so bizarre to me. It's bizarre upon bizarre that the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners come out with a statement that doctors don't need to and should not test for vitamin D levels. This is uh, this is counterproductive care system. Um, but, you know, we know who's driving these interests, and that is, again, Big Pharma uh, controlling uh, my profession. Well, we better pause at that stage because we've got to go to an advert now. But outside of that, uh, Ian Brighthope, uh, thank you. I'm coming back to you um, today, I hope, uh, on a particular subject that's uh, dear to me. And the next part will be, Ian, I'm going to ask you, I've just spoken to a politician in Western Australia who's said to me he's had three jabs. He said the two first jabs and a booster. And he said, and I, I thought, what protocols could he take that will help him either remove the spike protein or improve his immune system in case another uh, pandemic comes around? So we'll be back in a few minutes, everybody. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Russell.